Good Thursday afternoon, guys. My name is Jerry Miller, and welcome to the I Love Seville show. Thank you so much for joining us on an absolutely glorious day outside in central Virginia. You certainly feel a little bit of that transition from spring to summer now, but regardless, any day above the mud is a glorious day to be on this planet. We have a lot to be hopeful and positive for. We're coming out of this thing called COVID. Albemarle County has, has lifted the restrictions. So much to be thankful for. We're, we're of course live in Charlottesville, across Almore County, Central Virginia, the Commonwealth, the country and the world on the I Love Seville Network. We thank our partners at Ting Fiber Internet for powering the studio, crazy fast fiber internet, Ting Fiber Internet. Judah Wickhauer is our, our, our director. And Judah, before you go to the studio camera, why don't we go to the one shot? Ooh, that I is... I got a Claiborne education shirt on here. The material is top notch. I mean, this is essentially American apparel. I put this on and I felt like a million bucks. Imagine if you get some knowledge from Clayboard Education as well. This company is doing big time things, Clayboard Education. And on that note, let's welcome our friend, the CEO of Clayborn, to the show. Thanks. How are you? Thanks for having me, Jerry. Really appreciate it. Do, I do love that shirt, man. It just makes you look ripped. Oh, you know? thank it, you. It's definitely. One of the few times I do look ripped, and I, <laughs> I attest, I, I attribute it to the Clayborn shirt. You guys spare no expense with this one. You got to get a comfortable shirt. It's the most important thing. How often do you wear yours? Uh, it's basically my uniform. Unless I'm on your show, I'm wearing a Clayborn shirt, pretty much. You're I dress pretty up for your spiffy. Show. I always dress up for your show. You got the pocket square looking good. You, you look sharp. Got to go with the pocket square. Pocket square has to match the shirt too. You know, it's, it's all a coordination effort. So when when Lee is on the show, he's able to adapt to what we throw to him. So we're going to run headlines with Lee, um, and then we're going to talk about uh, a lot that he wants to cover on the show, including mental health. Definitely. We'll talk some PPP funding. Yeah. We'll talk about uh, unemployment. Unemployment, yeah. Housing crisis. Housing Look, crisis. Yeah. So much we're going to cover today. The first headline, and Judah, why don't you cue up the sound from her Facebook Live, and I'll count you in when we're going to play Mayor Walker's um, sound from earlier this week. Before we do, J-Dubs, I'll throw it to Lee. Um, the mayor, earlier this week, she said on Facebook Live that she's going to make the announcement tomorrow on whether she's going to run for um, election again, of course, as an independent. Um, I'm curious, what do you think? Open any question. Yeah, I would say in a vacuum, I, I would not put the chances of her running again very high. But if you look back at the, what's happened in the last five to six years in the national political climate, uh, the nation seems to be very forgiving of past transgressions and statements. And so I would say there's only maybe a 75% chance she's not going to run again. That's so you say 25% she chance, does? Only 25% chance she runs again. Okay. Um, for the sake of a talk show, and J-Dubs, you got that, that sound ready to go? Okay, cool. Thank you, my friend. I'll give you a countdown here in a second. From my perspective, I'll put the odds a little higher. Um, I'm going to put it at a 50-50. Wow. Uh, you know what? That's, that's not very ballsy. I'm going to say 60-40 she does run. Wow. And, and why I say 60-40 she does run is for a number of reasons. Uh, main source of income, um, the mayor pay for her. Um, what does the mayor pay? Uh, 20K. Okay, is that, is that on top of city councilor or, or that? No, 20,000 no. total. City councilors get 18K okay. a year. Um, Board of Supervisors, Almore County, 16,800 per year, roughly. Mm -hmm. um, prior to her being mayor, she was part-time in the Parks and Rec Department mm -hmm. at Charlottesville City. Um, she says in the sound, and we'll cue it up here in a matter of moments, that she feels she still has a lot of work to do. Um, she also mentioned that it's difficult to lead in a community like this. So the sound is 45 seconds. We'll play it for the listeners. Um, unfortunately, we cannot hear it in the studio. It's essentially what she's going to say is, I'm going to make the announcement this time tomorrow. We'll dot the I's and cross the T's after mm. that. We still have to talk on the show. Dirty Nellie's has been purchased. Patty Zeller gave me this tip yesterday. I reached out to the new owner of Dirty Nellie's, Jordan Bronco, who I've known since third grade. Um, I got an update for you on Nellie's. I want to pick this man's brain about Albemarle County repealing the COVID restrictions. And I also want to pick this man's brain about the latest development with unemployment pay. Now you have to show that you're applying for jobs to get the money. 
I should have been that way all along, <laughs> but I'll pick Lee Elberson's braid on that. Before we go there, J-Dubs, let's get that sound on the show. If you could play that, my friend, in three, in two, and in one. Through. So the reality is that I haven't made a decision about campaigning, um, running again. And I'm giving myself, as I was sitting here about to log on, because that's generally how things work in my life, until Friday, um, this Friday. And because I'll probably just say something because I'm talking. Um, but um, I think giving myself a deadline on um, Facebook Live will be very helpful. So I'm going to give myself until this Friday. I'll come on this Friday around the same time to um, let you all know what the decision is. Okay, so we'll know, Lee, this time tomorrow. Um, you say 25% she does. Can I change my percentage you can? now? You can. now? Yeah, I actually had not heard. I had I'd only seen the, the, the headline. I think the fact that she isn't, if she wasn't going to run, she probably just would have said so. So she's clearly on the fence. And if she's making an announcement, I'll go 40-60. Okay, so yeah. I went 60-40. So you say 40% she does. 40% says, yeah, I'll just be slightly on the other side of the, the coin there. Um, Alex, thank you. I like the shirt as well. Thank you very much. Um, why why why'd you uptick the percentage? Yeah, so, I mean, again, from what you're saying, if she's making an announcement, I think that's a much higher likelihood that she is going to do it. And the fact that she says there's still work left to do, that is riddled with somebody who has unfinished business and, and wants to, to try to see it through to completion. I feel the same way. I feel the absolute same way as my friend um, Lee Elberson. Tomorrow we'll know, and we will update you on the I Love Seville show. Frankly speaking, it's going to be front page and 6 o'clock, 11 o'clock news and, and, and fodder for radio and podcasts um, for, for days to come. So stay tuned. Um, now the next headline I want to throw to you. Can, real quick, can we sure. go back to this? Can we yeah. remind, uh, since you're a politician now, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Charlottesville is a soft government, so yeah. she's not elected. The, yeah. the city council appoint, like, it's called they, a weak mayor system. Weak mayor system. Yeah. Okay, and they come to a decision amongst one of them who is going to be it? That's correct. Hmm. So, so um, the five counselors elect the mayor and not the populace. Yeah. Here's an intriguing wrinkle for this storyline, my friend. Um, for, for her entire term, she's been the mayor. If she runs again and gets reelected the likelihood of the five on council voting her mayor for a third time is not likely. And the reason I make that statement is because, straightforward, this is not me speaking out of turn, she's had some friction with Cena McGill, Lloyd Snook, and Michael Payne. Uh, in 2021, lack of better phrase, she threw each of them under the bus and used the, the R word racist about them each time. So those are three of five. That's a majority right there. Um, I would expect our friend Juan Diego Wade to get one of the two spots. The other spot is completely wide open. If she chooses to run, the Standardsville, Virginia odds makers have Mayor Nakia Walker, the Standardsville odds makers do, have Mayor Nakia Walker as a slight favorite over Yaz Washington and Brian Pinkston. A slight favorite, the Standardsville odds makers do. So it's, it's another wrinkle. Um, will, will she be voted mayor again? Will she run? Um, we, I think Charlottesville and Central Virginia want to know. Yeah, this will be exciting. It will be exciting. Tomorrow we'll know more. How about the news about Dirty Nellies getting sold? I'll give a little background. Yeah. Um, so I heard this yesterday from Patty Zeller. She goes to Dirty Nellies often. Thank you, my friend, Patty Zeller. Um, Gary has been trying. Gary and Toby. Toby, rest in power. Gary, still the uh, current, current owner as of earlier this week. He sold the business to Jordan Brunk. Um, I grew up with Jordan Brunk, played travel soccer with him, went to school briefly with him at Walsingham in Williamsburg before he transferred to a different school. He's the owner of Buddhist Biker Bar on Ellywood. Buddhist Biker Bar Crozet Pizza on yeah. Ellywood Avenue. And he's got a strong music background. He's a musician himself. He's a restaurateur himself. He's committed to this community. This would be his second brand in his portfolio, Dirty Nellies. Important to emphasize that he's buying the bar and the business and not the real estate itself. Um, so Jordan's committed to maintaining the character of Dirty Nellies, live music, 
not changing much, but he is going to come in there with um, a younger mindset. He's upper 30s and maybe tweak it a little bit. How about tweaking a little bit? I'd say Dirty Nellie's is undoubtedly an institution in this community. Not many bars you can name that don't have windows. Not many bars that you can name that have wood-burning fireplaces. Not many bars that you can name that have arcades in the back of the bar. The punching bag that you can hit, you can get a Lady Godiva sub and have a cold beer by a wood-burning fireplace with Sherry, the bartender, keeping you on your toes. You want to hear something crazy? You've never been. Never been. Really? You and Alex would love it. All right. Now All that we're vaccinated, we are anxious to go out. So, yeah, we'll check it out. I think you guys would very, very much love it. Marquise Johnson is watching from Hampton, Virginia. He's sending love to both of us. Um, I think you're going to see the news about Dirty Nelly's guys in the news cycle after we put it out there. Um, so, folks, an institution has changed hands and now the next generation is carrying the torch for a brand that we love, Dirty Nellie's and Fry Spring Station. Our next headline, this gentleman can speak quite a bit about. This is about unemployment benefits. And the news now, starting May 30th, my friend Lee, um, people on unemployment must report a minimum of two job applications per week or else they could lose their eligibility. Yeah, I think... Uh, I think you're, you know, you have I've mentioned this many times. You're a fiscally conservative person, uh -huh. right? And so, socially liberal. Yeah, socially, socially liberal. Yeah. yeah. And so your uh, initial reaction is that this should have been this way all along. But over the course of the last year, the government has been trying to instill confidence in the economy. And for lack of better terms, you're, you're just trying to get money into the hands of, of people that, that need it and are likely to, to spend it. Now, I think this is a really good course correction, right? I think now we've got money, plenty of money out there in the economy. And so now it's time to sort of tighten the reins and slowly sort of wean everyone off of the, the subsidies. I feel the same. Yeah. I feel the same. Um, Sarah Simone. Um, says, great clean yeah. warm swag. She's watching right now. She's awesome. <laughs> Johnny or Ornalis, who owns uh, El Mariachi and uh, Guadalajara JPA, says, love the shirt. Looking good, my friend. The Claiborne shirt is getting a lot of props. I might, I might have to give some, give some away. Yeah. <laughs> I know. Patty Seller says, tell Jordan not to change anything uh, about the decor, decor, especially the painting over the fireplace. I love the painting over the fireplace too, Patty, and I love when people hang a cigarette from the hole in the painting over the fireplace. It's adorable. So I think all along, getting back to unemployment, and Marquise Johnson wants us to talk mental health. Interestingly that you bring up mental health, that's going to be a topic today, something that he wants to prioritize. Um, I was taken aback when I realized that folks were collecting unemployment without having to apply for jobs. Taken aback by that. Did you know that was the case all along? Mm -hmm. You did know that was the yeah. case? What do you think the thinking with that was? I, I, I think I, 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 I told you it's uh, trying to get money into the hands of people that need it the most. Now, granted, there probably should have been some a little bit better checks and balances, but I think over the course of the last 14 months, I think it's it's probably served its purpose really well. There's a lot of people that needed jobs and maybe the, the, they couldn't find those, those jobs, but now we know they got jobs out there, right? Marquis says it used to be three um, applications a week if you wanted to keep the unemployment. Mm -hmm. So he says two is still light. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a weaning off thing. It's, it's maybe in six months or the beginning of 2022, we make it three, right? To just slowly, I think anything abrupt right now is, is going to cause us some unintended consequences. So I think it's great to ease in. How do you think the ecosystem locally is going to play out? Because there, like you said, some really good jobs out there. I mention this on the show all the time. Wilson Ritchie posted on his Facebook page that he's willing to pay 50 to 70 K for an executive chef. And he's openly talking about it. He's giving $500 signing bonuses to employees who have been on staff for three months. They hit the 90-day marker. They get an extra 500 bucks in their paycheck to incentivize them st to stay sticky. Um, I guess what I'm going to say here is... Real quick, also, sure. you know, Keith mentioned also Brazos is uh -huh. hiring. Yeah. Uh, I go to Firefly often. You know, Melissa, the owner, yeah. she told me every time I go in there, she's like, we need help. 
We need help. If you know anybody that needs, needs a job here, we, send them our way. So Everyone needs help. Yeah. Everyone needs help. So how do you think it, the dominoes are going to fall? Um, there's some great jobs out there. My advice to anyone that's watching is pursue the great jobs immediately because those will be taken first. The unemployment's not going to last forever. Shift your focus and go aggressively after the best ones that are on the market because those will fall first. And then it's going to have a trickle down with the jobs that are left. You see it playing that way as well? Agreed. Yeah. I think that's, that's exactly what's going to happen. And I, I think it just naturally, we'll go over this, the, the PPP funding and the, and the stimulus bills was meant to just inject confidence in our economy. We're overly confident right now. If people are not finding jobs that are out there, we're overly confident. And so that money is not going to be, that, that money is, is drying up, right? There's not likely to be, I don't think, another round of PPP funding. Maybe I'm going to be wrong. Um, and in the stimulus uh, funding, you know, we've been, had three rounds of it essentially. Potentially we could see a fourth and, and fifth round, but that money is, is going to be less and less every time as well. I think, I think as well. Has to be. Um, the business owners that can't fill a full staff. I mentioned teenagers. Um, a lot of our clients, we won't name them, um, but a lot of them that are in F and B say we have to go after the teens now to work these positions. And a teenager, um, now they're not going to be able to get 40 to 50 hours a week because they have to go to school, but a teenager making 17, 18, 19 bucks an hour um, first or second job, I mean, goodness gracious, I remember my first job, so I'll tell you this, my first job was as a, as a bus boy at the Sportsman's Grill in Williamsburg. I think I made like six bucks an hour. The second job I had was I got entrepreneurial, you'll appreciate this. Of I course. went about, I went around our neighborhood, I was like 14 years old, knocking on doors, asking people to cut their grass for 25 bucks. And I had a group of 12-year-olds, I was 14, a group of 12-year-olds cut the grass because I realized that I could get six lawns on a Saturday and have them do the work, take half the money, as opposed to doing two lawns myself um, and making less. So that was the second job I had. Um, I guess where I'm going with this is, can you imagine, first, tell me what your employment was like as a teen, your first jobs, and then the second, can you imagine, Lee, 18, 19, 20 bucks an hour at 16, 17 years old? Yeah, I think, you know, there's probably going to be, uh, I think unintended consequences is something we're going to talk about a lot in this show. Yeah, my employment history, my dad was an entrepreneur. I think I told you this. He owned a merchandising company, and so he would have these big T-shirt events. So I worked for my dad, not for free. He certainly would pay me, but I don't know if there was like an agreed upon hourly rate. And so I was hustling, delivering T-shirts and, and selling T-shirts at, at events uh, probably since I was about eight or nine years old. My first real job was I worked at a go-kart place. and I think I made nine, eight... Maybe eight dollars an hour at the go kart place. At the go kart place, were you working on the go karts themselves? No, I was okay. helping people get in them. I was a terrible employee. I'd yeah. do all sorts of stupid stuff after hours. I'd put oil in the track and go and do donuts in them, and I'd let my friends in, and I'd show up late for work. Um, but yeah, I think it was eight dollars an hour. But yeah, at that point, it was primarily subsidized by my parents. Right? They pay. I think paid most of my insurance and I contributed some to gas and some to insurance. So I didn't have a good concept of what it was like to make, like whether I made $8 an hour or $15 an hour, probably didn't have a lot of impact on me. Well, I will say this. I remember um, the first shift that I worked as a busboy. I think I was 12 or 13 and I came home, I still remember it. I came home with two tens and three $1 bills, $23, two tens and three ones. And my mom picked me up from the shift because I couldn't drive. And I got in the back of the 1989 Volvo, um, a boxy gray one. And I said, mom, I got $23. And I felt like it was the greatest accomplishment in the world. I felt on top of the Blue Ridge, like I was on top of Carter's Mountain. Um, Johnny Ornalis is watching the show. He owns two restaurants. He says it's tough to compare teenagers today 
to when you guys were teenagers. Mm -hmm. Do you want to touch that one at all? Because you do work alongside a lot of teens at Claiborne, right? Yeah, I think there's this... That, I think that's 100% true, and there's probably a lot of different layers to that. One is, I would say when I was a teen, I didn't have a good understanding of what the different rates were amongst, uh, amongst professions. Now, I mean, it's, it's just a Google click away, you know, it's kids Instagram it, and so you're acutely aware of what your most successful peers make, which probably puts you in a position where you always think like you're playing catch up. I never felt like I was playing catch up. When I hear stories like you and I had similar friends who were just like making money hand over fist, I thought, wow, I didn't really even know that that was the case. I didn't know I was working for minimum wage, you know, and I didn't know that there was other opportunities out there. So I think now kids today are, are very aware of that. So they won't be as excited for a $20 an hour job as we would have been for a similar increase. Um Good point. This point is being made by Leslie, who's watching in Charleston. And she says, it's the influence of video games. The influence of video games has changed teens these days. Do you buy into that? I never really grew up playing video games. Oh, I grew up playing tons of video yeah. games, yeah. I'd... Was your screen time limited? I mean, my parents, my mom and dad, they gave us like 30 minutes of TV time a night. Literally. Good for you. you had, it was brutal. Yeah. It was tough. We couldn't, our, we got our first gaming system. It was the N64, Nintendo 64. Um, we got GoldenEye. Oh. Remember GoldenEye? We should have a GoldenEye yeah. tournament. <laughs> you would crush me. And then we started playing GoldenEye nonstop, and my mom's like, I got a throttle N64 usage. How about the impact of video and screen time on teens? Yeah, I think it's probably better to generalize screen, I think screen time, I think you hit on it. It's, it's a better generalization. Video game is just one type of outlet. But yeah, it's, 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 it's an easy outlet that student that, that kids can get quickly addicted to but social media is no different if the kid's not playing video games and they're on instagram for seven or eight hours a day that i don't see that as a as much different it's something that's detracting their time and work is just going to be something that's prying them away from that so i don't know if we had those to the same level those types of activities when we were kids you know i'm gonna read you got me thinking and this is what i enjoy about doing the show with you is that i we just think about stuff on the fly i'm gonna read you a facebook post about social media from adrian eckner she's a photographer in the area she's a um uh, a photographer and an entrepreneur and she wrote this about facebook she basically said why is Facebook not yet a utility service? This is a community service. It should be a public utility. Um, in the modern age, certain entities cannot succeed without Facebook. For small businesses, it's an essential tool for marketing and community engagement. Any enterprise that at that level of influence and ubiquity needs to be delegated accordingly. And on a personal level, completely aside from financial gain, I've utilized the groups featured by posting internationally and literally helped save a woman's life by finding her a donor. My proposition would be treating Facebook with the same courtesy as the phone book, a free public service platform, platform through which people can communicate and connect. Okay, so as you know, I've been off of Facebook for eight years. Uh, does, isn't Facebook free? Well, I, th I think what she's saying, Facebook is free. Yeah. Um, I think what she's saying is perhaps it should become um, an entity of the government. Um, and, and, and from a surefire way to tank it. <laughs> yeah, that's absolutely right. And from my standpoint as a libertarian, I, I, it's tough to swallow. But her point is it's become so powerful and influential that it can impact elections. Small businesses, some of them don't have websites, but they have Facebook pages. Mm -hmm. You can make a legitimate argument that a small business is gonna have a hell of a lot more traffic on its Facebook page than its actual website, because the people are within the Facebook platform seeing the brand, as opposed to having to click out of the platform to go to a sideload website. Um, it's pretty powerful. Um, so you say no to the public utility. No. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I think, I don't know if you're going to like this or not. I, I think better regulation so that it's not manipulated in the way it was with the... Um, the election? Uh, yeah, what was the, comp the big company that uh, ran it? It's escaping me for some reason. It'll come to me later. But yeah, if a company is able to uh, manipulate the, the data, the algorithms to 
Yeah, manipulate to get election. content to show up on news feeds. Yeah, sure. Uh, but I think you know you said something compelling to me about the the future of websites versus social media. You know that like you should just spend your time on social media. Websites are are they a something of the past? And this is coming from someone who makes his money building websites. Um, and I'm gonna <laughs> maybe it's not the smartest business move, but I'm gonna straight up say it. Like people live within the social platforms. If you can create and populate content for your brand within the social platforms, that's going to be as effective, if not more effective, for your call to action messaging than putting it on the website itself. Hmm. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I, I guess it's not much different. I was I was thinking, you know, you you know for sure that Facebook collects and monetizes your data, but if you go to a website, businesses collect your data all the same. Right. But the, uh, most businesses are not likely to m be able to monetize and sell your data. Because they're not they're, sophisticated enough. Yeah, and, and they're actually just using it to build a better user experience. Whereas Facebook, it, that may be a byproduct, but that's not their main driving yeah. factor. They're, they're trying to make money off yeah. of all the clicks. Sure. So that's, I think, where you run into problems. Well said, well said. Um, we're going to get to uh, the graphs that you have. Before we do, one other topic I want to throw to you. Albemarle County has repealed all COVID restrictions. Um, so now the onus um, is on the business owner on what he or she wants to do with COVID-19. What do you think, my friend? Uh, I'll tell you what, we, we're struggling with it. I think from a national scale, I was happy to hear the CDC's announcement and validation that the vaccine, fully vaccinated people have the liberties that they had before the pandemic. And the onus is now on non-vaccinated people to continue to wear a mask. And localities are following suit with that. I think part of the issues with running a business is, I've said this over and over, you really have to survey your client base. And you have to understand what your staff and what your client's comfort level is. So if I have a client who comes to me and says, oh, I only want to work with vaccinated staff, I say, or I only want to, I only want to work with you know, vaccinated tutor or vaccinated staff. I say, okay. And then I think, okay, but you're going to come in, you're going to wait in a waiting room. Do I now have to ensure that the person next to you is also vaccinated? If not, then I guess then for, for safety's sake, I just have to require everybody to wear a mask in the waiting room. Or I have to have everyone who's coming into the office send us email us their vaccination cards, and now I have to ask and make sure that staff is comfortable disclosing their vaccination cards to us. And so, you know, the, the easiest thing to do is to say, well, let's just keep the mask mandate with the business um, unless we, you know, I think the calculus, and you and I talked about Your this Your business earlier. is a little different, though. Our business is a little different, yeah, right? Yeah. So if you think that you're more likely to detract customers with the mask mandate then without, then as the business decision is to just run it without. The CDC and the localities are saying, this is fine, okay? You're not, you shouldn't receive any legal recourse. And that's what you think of as a business owner. As the businesses get uh, farther and farther outside of that standardization, you have to take into account some of these considerations. I would say high value, sir, high value one to one services are, are probably going to have to consider keeping the mask mandate, at least in some shared areas. Uh, Johnny Ornalis, two restaurant owner, has a question for you. Um, is it legal? Is it not considered discrimination? Can we ask folks if they've been vaccinated? Can we ask them and require them to put on a mask if masks are not required? Uh, well, in the state of Virginia, you still can. You can refuse service. If you, you can say our business requires that you wear a mask. I don't think that there's been any legislation. I know Florida has, and there's a couple of other states that are saying it's illegal for states to, or for businesses to require a mask. But I think in the state of Virginia, you still can. Here's, how about this question? And we've brought this up before. It's very intriguing. So when a child goes to school, that child has to show proof of vaccination for what? Measles, chicken pox, which, which do they have to show? You know more about this than I do. I should know this. MMR, more. Measles, mumps, and I can't pronounce the other one. It starts with an R. Right, right. So they have to show that they've been vaccinated before they go into school. 
I would imagine once vaccines are available for children and they're gonna start rolling out for 12 year olds very, very soon, 12 and up very, very soon. I have a three year old and my wife and I cannot wait till our little guy can get vaccinated himself. But I would imagine those same requirements are gonna be for COVID when they go to school in the fall or potentially the spring semester. Do you agree? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a liability. I mean, I think the, the consideration for any business owner is not that I'm trying to enforce my view of vaccinations is I'm just trying to reduce my liability. Somebody comes into our office with COVID and gives it to somebody who has not been vaccinated. They have COVID and they give it to somebody who has been vaccinated. You're going to see, I mean, a major backlash and that I would imagine that person's going to be very upset and that happens, right? Didn't New York Yankees, didn't they get COVID even though they had all been vaccinated? Yeah. Like seven of them. So that, I would imagine, is, is the case that all business owners fear and them saying, you didn't put me in a safe environment. Steven says, Steven's watching outside Atlanta. Is it in Buckhead, Steven? I think you're in Buckhead. There's a large UVA contingent in Buckhead that watches the show. And he says, isn't that a HIPAA violation if we ask our employees whether or not they've been vaccinated? And I've made the parallel to a colonoscopy. What boss asked their employee, hey, have you gotten your colon checked? Now, the flip side to that argument is a colonoscopy and colon cancer is not contagious in the air and can't affect other people in the room. Yeah. But the, the point is no boss is going to ask their team member, have you done this? Do you think a boss can legitimately ask their team member, show me your vaccine card, sir? I mean, it, is it Would that? you do that? Would I ask? Yeah. Yes. Team members? Yes. Yeah. And yeah. did anyone feel... We, we, sent a, we sent an anonymous survey out and asked people whether they've been vaccinated uh, and what their comfort level was about returning to, to in-person interactions because we're still 100% virtual. So you, we required our employees at some point early in the pandemic to disclose their symptoms and their history and hit, like their exposure risks and all of that. And we all had to do that when we went into businesses, right? You went into ACAC and they asked you that. So is ACAC was checking my temperature. Yeah. And they had a list of questions that we had to say no yeah, to. Right. Have you been in, like, tell me, tell me who you've been in contact with is, I mean, they're not asking you for specific names, but they're, they're asking you those details. And so this is just, a way to, to ensure that all of those have, have been the case. So I don't think it's that much farther of a step than what we were already doing. So on that note, and Neil Williamson's watching from the Free Enterprise Forum, Detective Michael Wells is watching the show. Um, I got your email. Um, you're fantastic people. Mike Wells, I will follow up. Um, based on what you're saying, are we heading the road to the vaccination passport? Yeah, I don't know what where this has me fall on the political spectrum. I, I just know that you're torn I, on this. Uh, I'm I'm a, I'm a little bit torn, but I I tend to fall on the more oversight is likely better. So I don't see a problem with a vaccination passport. Okay, I'm curious if it's for if it's for the public good. You know that they're they're enforcing this, saying what we're trying to do is prevent more people from dying. Carter um, Williamson says, a vaccination passport seems like an intrusion on my liberties. Hmm. Does, th does somebody telling you how much, you can, how much alcohol you can drink, is that an intrusion on your liberties? Does driving a car at the same time, is that also an intrusion of your liberties? It, yeah, maybe, but it's trying to prevent you from killing other people. Forcing you to wear a seatbelt is trying to prevent you from killing yourself. Um, and so I think... We don't have 100% freedom in this country, and I think the statement that we do is, is false. Um, so Alex Asher is watching the show in Texas. Alex, love you, homie. He says, honest work builds a person's sense of dignity and self-worth. That's a great story about your first $23 made, Jerry. Thank you, my friend, Alex Asher. Vanessa Parkhill, if Starbucks can bar entry to those illegally carrying a firearm, they should be able to require mask if they do choose. I'm not saying whether they should or not. I'm just saying it would be legal. What do you think? Agreed. Well, well said. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you need to have her on the show. But she's phenomenal. Yeah. She's a bookkeeper, um, an accountant for many businesses in the area, and she's got a great um, 
sense of like sensibility and physically conservative and understands the mindset of entrepreneurs. Our buddy Blake Hawthorne is watching oh. and I'm making sure to read his comments. Blake's always got good comments, so you got to read them. Yeah. Blake, is, in, is he in Cali? Blake's in California, yeah. Okay. He says, Lee, have you told Jerry Miller that you worked on a project that fired lasers to disperse gold particles <laughs> much in the same way Doc OC did in Spider-Man 2? <laughs> what is that? He's talking about my work at uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab. Blake was lucky enough. They don't usually let civilians in, but I think twice in the last 50 years they've had a visitor day, and Blake got to visit the National Ignition Facility, which is a multi-billion dollar fusion reactor, and it was used in the movie Star Trek. So that's what Blake's <laughs> This guy. Nobody wants to hear about rocket fusion. <laughs> Nobody wants to hear about fusion reactions on this slow. We'll, we'll lose viewers if I start talking about fusion. But that worked in your uh, that worked in your charming pitch with Alex to woo your wife, right? Yeah, that's true. She got she got the nerdy guy, right? <laughs> You're not a nerdy guy. You are definitely not. Blake also says data mining from Cambridge Analytica. Cambridge Analytica is what yeah, you were good. looking for. Mm -hmm. Yep, was used in the 2016 election along with the Russian interference utilizing memes. Mm -hmm. He says, I feel that in time it will be shown that the timing of the CDC guideline changes are part of an effort to stave off inflation. The problem is that removing mask guidelines the way they did is only going to add to confusion and manipulation of arguments that have always been against it. Blake Hawthorne, I'm Dude, giving you, you like and props on that comment right so, there. That's why I had to tell you to read his comments. I know, that's He's damn good, Blake. Good <laughs> yeah, I'm, hold on, I'm responding. you got to carry the show right now because i got to respond to Blake, okay? Yeah. So I think, yeah, Blake's, uh, Blake's discussion is is definitely on point and one of the reasons why I was uh, chiming into your show with Keith the other day is you know Warren Buffett is very outspoken about his um, what he thinks the future of the economy is and lots of economists are just baffled that we are not that, that we're continuing to see increases when they would expect to see decreases so something odd is going on and I think inflation is definitely on, on the horizon and you know the the term hyperinflation is something everybody should google let's talk and, about and that. look at it yeah walk us through that yeah so you know the the idea is that uh hyperinflation is is let's start at the, at the the most extreme hyperinflation is when the the value of your currency is depreciating at a rate that is measured in days and not month, like quarters or years. And if you inject too much capital into the economy, you risk moving into a period of, of hyperinflation. And many countries have suffered this. I think Zimbabwe was one of the most famous. They had a trillion dollar bill because they just kept, they, they, they were running out of points. And at some point, the people were getting paid more in the afternoon than they were getting paid in the morning. So I think that is the danger with injecting as much cash as we did into the economy. And some of the graphs I show talk a little bit about how much was specific, specifically in, injected into Should we Virginia. get them on screen? Uh, we'll do it in, in a okay. little bit. Let's okay. finish this. What do, you, okay. like, what do you think? Have you kept up with what Warren Buffett's outlook I is? have. Yeah. I what, have. What do you think? So I am I'm an entrepreneur and a businessman. So I'm generally bullish with my mentality. I have found in life that when, I, when my back is against the wall, my best performance comes out. Um, so that's why generally I'm bullish. I am very fearful of inflation. Alex Erpe, who has a show on this network today, nice. manana, says it's a supply um, issue, not a demand issue. So because of that, he's less worried. Basically, he's saying it's, it's, it's people want to spend money. They want to go out there. They want to shop. The reason price is going up is because of supply chain constraints. And then if we can eventually figure out the supply chain, fuel costs going down, getting people in the back of a house and restaurants working. Um, if we can figure those elements out, he thinks pricing will stabilize again. Um, I think that the last six months of this year are gonna be some of the best in American economy history. We're all ready to get out and spend. Um, I am very concerned of the housing market and this potential bubble that's on the horizon. I know some of the graphs are tied to that mm -hmm. that we're gonna get to, but I'm generally bullish of what's coming up. So when do you think we're going to go into a recession? We're gonna, right? So when, so when is it going? Is it going to be in 
A year? Would is it you characterize twenty twenty as the recession? Didn't we just get out of a recession? You mm. don't characterize that as a recession? I mean, statistically and by the definition, it was a recession. You don't characterize that? Yeah, I think maybe with an asterisk. Um, I, yeah, I guess me being bearish is that we are headed for a severe recession after we see some of these booms. So the definition of a recession is a period of temporary economic decline during mm -hmm. which trade and industrial activity are reduced, generally uh, identified by a fall in GDP in two successful quarters, two uh, successive quarters, mm -hmm. excuse me. So that's what we had. Now, to your point, it was a recession tied to a pandemic that no one expected. It wasn't necessarily a recession like we saw in 2008 that was associated with the, the collapse of the housing market. Um, so you see 2022 as potentially <laughs> recession. You don't have to be. Why too am I always bearish you're on this shit? You're always the bull here, and I'm always the bear. I, I, you know, I think why we go well. I, I think why it is is because um, I'm gonna give you props. You think of things from so many different angles. You're an incredibly bright man. You have a small touch of paranoia in there. <laughs> oh, yeah. A small touch. Is that fair? Oh, 100%. A small I, touch. I, I grew up in Louisiana, yeah. okay? There's a little bit of paranoia. You have a small touch of paranoia in there, which I respect and appreciate. Um, I, you know, I just think that, um, and I hope, I hope you're wrong, and I hope I'm right. I, I, I think we as Americans, and we're going to get to these graphs. He did a lot of research. We have more money than we've ever had. Mm -hmm. We have less debt than we've ever had. We have an eager to spend that money more than we ever have because we've been quarantining for so long. Like how could these elements eventually, or how could these elements turn into a recession so quickly? Question for you. Yeah, that, that's, that's a good thought, right? So what's gotta happen for it to be the case? Like what do you think would happen for us to get there? This is why you need smarter people than me doing this. So I, I think with, with what Alex is saying, if it's a supply issue, then what are, like, what are people going to be spending their money on? Like, if people are wanting to spend their money and they have some liberties in where they spend it, then they're going to be spending it in industries that don't normally see that type of increase, and that could cause a rapid change in how our GDP is structured, and maybe it causes it for the best and maybe there's some consequences that we're not yet aware of and i know that's a very vague answer but that's that's the paranoia in me how how about this um we're gonna have chef jabari wallington on the show tomorrow and he did um an economic analysis on social media that i saw and i was impressed with and he basically said this it's going to be a snapshot he's going to say with with restaurants having to pay an inc increased wage for employees. I mean, we're heading down to a $15 minimum wage. We all know that, okay? Mm -hmm. With restaurants having to pay increased wages to employees, and with the cost of goods increasing extremely high, we're eventually going to get to a point where a chicken sandwich at a sit-down restaurant is going to be $20. In a sit-down restaurant, a mob and pop, a $20 chicken sandwich, they're going to have very little profit. And then he compared and contrasted that scenario with what, like a big box restaurant, like a McDonald's or like a KFC or Wendy's that has much stronger cash positions, economies of scale, are able to buy goods and food in much larger bulk so they can get lower prices. And his prediction is fast food and chain restaurants, because of their economies of scale and purchasing power, are, able, are gonna be able to keep menu prices much lower than the mom and pop that does not have the same advantages. Mm -hmm. And this chef's prediction, he's coming on tomorrow to talk about this, is the big box restaurants, the chains, the Applebee's, the Chili's, the McDonald's, the KFC's are gonna now erode even more market share away from the mom and pop because the mom and pop is not gonna be able to win the pricing battle. The delta in the pricing battle is going to expand even more. I mean, heck, you can get a chicken sandwich. It's not going to be nearly as good, but you can get a chicken sandwich at what? KFC for two bucks and change. What do you think of this topic? I think he's 100% right. I think the change in Charlottesville will happen slower. Charlottesville does not like big box outfits. I mean, five guys couldn't make it on the downtown mall. 
Isn't that crazy? That's crazy. That one of the most popular <laughs> could not make it on the downtown mall because Charlotte's Philians really believe in buying local. And so I think that change will happen slower. But if the businesses are closing, pe- are closing people just aren't going to have a, the choice, right? If the only place to get a chicken sandwich is Chick-fil-A or KFC, then that's where they're going to go. But again, entrepreneurism, somebody is going to see that, that, that need and continue to try it. You know, you're, you're never going to see uh, the stopping of businesses wanting to start up. Maybe you have more and more startups going and trying to fill that need, and maybe they find a better way to do it. Maybe there's more food carts on the downtown mall. But I do think that entrepreneurism is always going to thrive. And yeah, You're the chairman of the Community Investment Collaborative. And the CIC is the place to get knowledge if you're a small business owner and you want to come to market with a brand. It's also a fantastic resource if you need some funding for your business. 100%. If you had, you also mentor so many people. And I hear about these from your mentees regularly, especially when you come on the program. Would you, if you had a mentee that's trying to get into business and they wanted to open a brick and mortar sit down restaurant, what would you say to them? I have had many mentees. This come has to happened me with that. Oh, yes. recently. Yes. Uh, post COVID. Uh, not post COVID, but just before COVID. Isaiah Brooks, Cajun King Restaurant. Oh, ACAC is Isaiah Brooks. Yeah. I love Isaiah. Dude, Isaiah's awesome. Yeah. So Isaiah and I were. Isaiah's from New Orleans, so yeah. he and I talk gumbo recipes, and he's legit. Okay, I can vouch for him. Um, yeah. So we we talk about what go to market strategy looks like for a small entrepreneur and. Opening up a, a brick and mortar immediately is huge risk. I mean, even if you have, if you're fully capitalized and you have great marketing, you're still taking a pretty big chance. So the go-to-market strategy for something like that is exactly what Angelique Jenkins did with Angelique's Kitchen. You start off with a food truck. Prove yourself food with trailer. A, yeah, food yeah, trailer. Yeah, food trailer. Start off with a food truck or food trailer or even a food cart if you could do it first. Get your proof of principle or your proof of performance as you'd like to talk about a lot first and then slowly start to build that into a restaurant and that's that's an easy way easier way to ooch in because you could probably build a food truck for 35 40 grand if you do some of the work yourself and, and outfit it yourself whereas Especially a restaurant if alex is your wife <laughs> oh she could she yeah. could do it for like 5k i mean you've seen what she did to jeep vader yeah, yeah. You basically have a food truck i got a refrigerator in the back of my jeep right now um yeah so i think that's that makes it a lot easier for for entrepreneurs to, to get into the space and so maybe we get a bigger food truck scene here that would be awesome do you think charlottesville i've wondered this so many times do you think charlottesville is set up for food truck success now, food trucks on the weekends, no doubt, can go to the many vineyards we have. And once music and, and live events come, they can go to the pavilion for Fridays after five. The tough part of the food truck business is what happens to your business Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You know, like in New York City, densely populated area, DC, whatever it may be, you have thousands of people walking by every corner that are looking for something quick to grab when they're heading to the subway or to the bus or to work here. Is the food truck scene in Charlottesville legit? I mean, is Charlottesville set up for food truck success? Uh, let's take what's happened to since the pandemic and the work from home movement uh, out of it. So I would say it's difficult because you need uh, a high congestion of businesses where people are walking outside and immediately looking for something to eat, which used to be the downtown mall, but there's not a great place to park. Ix already has some, some, some food spots. And so I, I think you're right that it's difficult during the week to support a food truck. Now that the work from home movement has, has been furthered, I think it's even harder. Right? Yeah. So maybe you're killing my idea. No, so, I'm just spitballing yeah. with you. Johnny Ornalis, the two restaurant owner, says providers have told me already that more volume companies will be getting better pricing and have privileges on certain products, so mom and pops are screwed. It's so sad. He says oil, chicken, wings, etc. They're going to give better pricing and prioritize selling these goods to volume businesses over businesses like mine. 
we need to brainstorm these ideas. And for all business owners, reach out to Community Investment Collaborative. We now in, in, encompass the, the Small Business Development Center. We just hired a brand new full-time consultant who's a, who's a mentor for, for businesses of, of any size. Um, if you're looking to get capitalization, it's a great place to go. So yeah, I think probably the need for workshopping this idea and how to make sure that local restaurants are successful. Multiple people are saying, including Johnny, um, including Steven, that we need a food truck park. Where would we put it? That's the concern. Mm -hmm. The city of Charlottesville does not have the land for a food truck park. And if we do land a food, for anything, right. And if we do the food truck park too far to the urban ring, then the concern is you don't have the density customer base. Where, do, where, do, where are some of the hubs in town for businesses? Downtown. Downtown. Um, I'd say downtown. I, I, Ix is yeah. close enough. You could, you know. I'd say Ix. Um, I'd say, where else is a hub? I mean, would you say Pantops is a hub for yeah. businesses? I mean, because you got the food trucks at Freebridge there at the base of Pantops Mountain. Mr. Cosner allows those food trucks to post up for, I believe it's 20 or $25 a day. That's where Angelique started. Yeah, I wonder, could they go to the, near Martha Jefferson? Martha Jefferson yeah. High Street. Yeah. There's a lot there with CFA. Mm -hmm. um, Florence, Worley Via. What happens, fellas, to people that your doctor says can't take the vaccine? Yeah, I mean, it, there's, um, that, that's another piece of the, the calculus. I think there's a difference between vaccine hesitancy and, and people who can't get it for medical reasons. Um, if we can get to herd immunity, I think this is what the, what the push to get as many people who can get the vaccine as but possible. But you said that was, I, I'm learning from you, was that 85% of 330 million. Yeah. Basically, we needed about 290 million people in America to be fully vaccinated before we were at herd immunity. I mean, it... it, it, it could be lower. It really depends on the distribution, but we're not even close to that right, right. now. So those people should content. You're, you're going to have to wear masks until we get this problem contained. And the longer we let the problem go, the more likely the variants are to, to be around. So it's, it's grim. And I'm sorry if you, if you can't get the vaccine, wear a mask can be as safe as possible because the people I know who've got COVID have severe consequences. One of them, she was big time runner and still a year later still can't run That's still having respiratory issues so. um, more com the comments come in when we talk and you know we're already we haven't we, even gotten the graph i know can we go long do you have anything to do i got something right at two is that true yeah sugar beans is that true yeah can, can we delay that or is it uh, important so me, one let, so let me see it's, it's a can we ask I noel guess. noel is watching I guess, no, well, I have my student's number. I'll just reach out to him. Can we, are you going to reach out to him on the phone, on the show? No, I'm not going to reach out. I'm going to text him and okay. see if If that's okay, push. I don't mean to put you in a spot. I just, I want to get to these graphs. Mm -hmm. Vanessa Parkhill says, about six years ago when I worked at Martha Jefferson Hospital, off-site, in-office, not patient-facing, we were required to get a flu shot or wear a mask while at work. So there is a precedent for employees, uh, employers to make the requirement. Maybe they will not do so until vaccines are beyond emergency approval. I guess we are always free to find a new employer if we are not satisfied with the given, given environment um, or current situation. Um, Keith Smith is now watching the program right now. You have, from what I can tell, 11 real estate agents watching the show, oh, including the president of CAR. Oh, man. Quentin uh -oh. Beckham. <laughs> okay. 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 So let's I, talk housing. Okay, let's talk housing. Uh, Judah, if you want to pull up the, uh, the uh, graph on uh, housing, it's not the PPP and not the stimulus one. And give and, us and, a thumbs up. Okay, and leave that on screen for a little while. My apologies. Thank you. I'll, I'll include the, I'll have, G, I should have sent the references ahead of time. Uh, I didn't give Keith enough. Uh, He's watching. I know. I didn't yeah. give him enough headway to get the the historical data. What I really wanted to look at, and and it was great to have the conversation with Keith, is what is the 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 house price to income ratio? What does that look like historically? I know for certain that at some point, uh, when in talking to my grandmother, housing was kind of like a it was a commodity like you know, buying groceries or something where it's just like, oh, well, it's, it's, it's fairly cheap. It's close enough to our income that we, we have a house. We didn't really look at it as investment because it was pretty flat. 
Um, at some point, that start, those two lines started to increase at different rates, right? The, the median income inflates with, you know, whatever the, the standard inflation rate is for income. But then the average... What's that, generally 1%, 2 3%? Yeah. Then the housing price increased at a, at a higher rate. And you can see at times during, um, it, during recessions... The, the housing, the, the average housing price fluctuates, the average home price fluctuates a lot more than, than, than the, the income, which obviously is a good thing. But I, I pulled the data for Virginia, and I had to use, oh God, I forgot what it's called. It's the... Guys, look at the screen at the graph. Is the graph still on? Look at the screen. Yeah. So can we put it... Sure, we can so, put it on. So why don't you get on screen here so we can reference it. And viewers that are watching the show, you get an advantage over those that are listening to the show on Spotify, iTunes, or Apple Podcasts because we do do visual elements on the program. Our friend Judah Wickhauer, we're now leveraging the big screen here. Okay. And, and, and Professor Elberson is... Yeah, okay, this is not Professor Elberson. This is some rinky-dink physicist who just pulls data. Now, I use Census Bureau and, I, I, and verified sources for this. But this is what it looks like for the median income, which is the blue graph, which, as, as uh, my colleague Jerry said, it's about 1% or 2%. You can see that at some point in the 80s, you see the, the, the slope of this median housing price, which is the red thing, start to increase pretty dramatically. And then it levels off. So in the 90s to 2000s, we, we have, it, it's increasing at the same, right, same rate as median income, which to me seems like that's, that is fine. What I've done to simplify this is this purple dotted line is just the ratio of the house price to income. So I think it starts off at about two or three. I didn't label it. And then right now, I think it's at about four. So the average... Um, Income is about the median income is about seventy thousand, and then the median uh, home price is somewhere around three hundred thousand. So, any time that that is in, if, if that that ratio should be flat, which means that on average you could afford a home with the same ratio ten years ago as you could now. Any time that is increasing dramatically, you're you're gonna, pricing people out. Yeah, you're well, you're pricing people out, but you're also causing investment opportunities. So the people who are going to buy it are thinking, wow, look at how quickly this is increasing compared to the people that can buy it. So this is why I, I think you end up getting shortages. Now, this only goes to 2019. What I'm challenging my friend Keith Smith to do is to pull this data for the last year. I think it would be really fascinating to see what it looks like on a, on a micro level. This is a macro level. So when I look at this, this Quinton is... or Keith? Quinton, Keith, any of the agents watching, if you can offer any perspective on this, that would be much appreciated. Yeah. So to me, this is when I think about like why there's an affordable housing crisis, this is why there's an affordable housing crisis. The rate at which or the median income is not keeping up with the medium housing price. Okay. Is, does that make sense Yeah, to that you? makes sense. I'll okay. add, I'll add um, to this. Why there's also an affordable housing crisis is we have limited inventory, new construction has, has, has not kept up with the demand and that's been going on for a long period of time. Keith, you taught me that. We have interest rates at all time lows, so we have a larger buyer pool. And frankly speaking, we live in an area that is great to live in and people want to move to. Realtor Magazine said baby boomers, this area, the second most popular area for baby boomers to move to in the entire country. The people that live across the street from me sold a $1.2 million townhome in the D.C. area. It was like 1,100 square feet. And then they bought an $800,000 home. They banked close to 400K, and they got a crib that's 5,000 square feet compared to their 1,000 square foot crib in Northern Virginia. And they're both working with DC salaries from an ISP in Albemarle County. Yeah. That COVID has compounded the affordable housing crisis. Yeah, absolutely. And I wonder, again, this is something I'd be curious for Keith, for, for Keith and I to do, is to look at it at an even more macro level. At what point did we get away from house a house just being a commodity? Was it better that way where it's like, Houses are just meant to put bodies in, and they're, and they're going to increase at the same rate as income. Oh, this is a great topic, um, and I, I'll play devil's advocate with you. You always do. I, I, I think so you I, run a good show. I, By I the think, way, my student said that uh, we can push it to to two thirty. So okay, I have an extra fantastic. Hour. We have more yeah. Lee, more yeah. Professor Lee. I, I I think. I mean, let's cut to the chase. For so many Americans, 
the home they own is their top is their top item in their portfolio. You know, so for and we're just talking on a talk show here. I think that the home is a commodity, and it's a way to accrue wealth, and it's a way to pass wealth to your the next generation, generational wealth. Um, I, I I don't think a home should just be looked at as a place to live. If it was just a place to live and nothing more, think about the collateral damage of that, of what it could do to the supply chain of housing. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's not a problem, you know, it, it's, we can't reverse it now. I just, you know, in looking at, again, to play the other side yeah, of devil's yeah, advocate. Yeah, that's why we're good. Yeah. It, it the just, bull and the bear. It, it, creates, <laughs> it, it creates a system by which you, if your grandfather was able to buy his yeah. house in a time period at which it was dominated by white men, then white men are going to continue to keep all of the wealth. And, and we know something is wrong with that system. And so I'm just trying to, I just like to look at like where the problem started and think it, if the system worked better, then is there any similarities to the system we have now that we could try to emphasize? Because have you ever heard the parable of the babies coming down the river? No. Yeah. So there's this village and, you know, somebody's out washing something and all of a sudden a baby comes down by the river. Wasn't this in the Bible? Wasn't there a baby <laughs> put on a river? It was, uh, this is Judah Wicca. I, I, yeah. Moses. Okay. Ma- yeah, we may be talking no. about different things. Okay. So I, I'm, uh, CNE is doing a diversity, equity, and inclusion workshop, and I heard a really great example of this. So, you know, you see it, and it's like, oh, there's, there's, it's a baby. I'm going to pick this baby up and go. And then somebody else goes, and it's like, oh, there's, there's another baby. And so, oh, we need to build a system to take care of these babies. And then some brilliant person like Jerry says, wait a second, why don't we go upstream and find out where the babies are coming from? <laughs> and so this is us, like, looking and saying, okay, we, we have this issue now. Instead of trying to fix this issue, let's figure out what's happening upstream. Obviously, there's smarter people than me that are working on this and, and realize where this wealth inequality has come from. But I think a lot of it has been influenced by the housing market, right? It was rich white men were able to accumulate land and wealth, and they have just kept it this entire time. And what you do to, to keep that is to make sure that escalator goes up. Say, hey, keep the, the median income this level. Because they have... And then escalate it, because guess what? Yeah, it makes People, them more money. Exactly. And yeah. it prevents, it puts that barrier to entry where you'll never be able to get in. So yeah. that's on the macro level... I'm not the first, I mean, everybody in yeah. economics realizes that, but I think that's part of the issue. Stephanie Rhodes says, that was Moses, Jerry. That was Moses. Stephanie Rhodes, you keep us on our toes. Nailed Thank it. Thank you very much, Stephanie Rhodes. Marquis says, I can't afford to live in my hometown. I can't afford to live in my hometown. Um, well, you got a lot of folks watching you here on every social platform possible. Um, Lee, this is a good question for you. Uh-oh. This is a tough one. This is from Spencer. Um, Spencer says... Lee, for those of us that worked hard to buy our homes, don't we want them to appreciate in value? Uh, He's basically saying not everybody inherited their home. Yeah, well, okay, sure. Why does everything you buy have to appreciate in value? We we have set a system where we, yeah, I... Because we're Americans. Capitalism. I'm not saying that it, it has to that it has to change. I'm just saying that like, this is how you create a system of any, any, I think this is how you create a system of inequality. A car doesn't appreciate. Why don't I want to buy a car? I want my Jeep to appreciate. Actually, technically, I has. think your Jeep has appreciated. The, de- the dealership actually offered me more than I paid for. <laughs> yeah, because you it tricked funny. it out. Yeah, well, also, there's a weird used car uh, inventory thing happening. Because right a now. new car, when you drive it off the lot, drops 40% in value as soon as you drive it off the lot. A yeah. new car is one of the worst investments that you could potentially make. Yeah. It's not an investment, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. So you want to see... No, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just asking, like, you, we've been told that a house is an investment ever since a house became an investment, but that wasn't always the case. If you look back, I wasn't able to get the data, but in the 40s, a house wasn't seen as an investment. It was just a place that you lived. 
Bill says, I need to go back to Sunday school to learn about my biblical parables. <laughs> I'm sorry, Bill and My mom used to have my brother and I as the Sunday school teachers. That's how we got out of big church by well, going Judah, to was, Sunday school. Uh, should we ask, ask Judah, was that the same story? Was I selling the same story? We were talking about the same thing? Judah, let's get the mic in front of you. You have so much to offer, my friend. Yeah, we don't put Judah I know. on. We, I try to. I try to. But nobody can do his job is the problem. <laughs> It's like he, his parable was, let's go upstream to see where the babies are coming from. That yeah. was the point of his parable. Yeah. I don't think that's the same as the, the Bible verse. So the, you, you notice a baby comes out, and then another baby comes out, and then babies just start flowing downstream, and the village is worried about taking care of the babies, and no one's worried about going upstream and finding out who's putting the babies What there. was the Moses parable? I have parable? no idea where that's from. Okay. Okay, what was right. the Moses parable? Uh, the Moses parable is that uh, the princess of... Uh, of Egypt found a baby, or maybe her nursemaids found a baby floating in the reeds, and they picked it up and took it, and she decided to raise it as her child. It eventually became a grown-up Moses, who was the not really brother to the actual, you know, eventual pharaoh of Egypt. That guy's good at I history. Know. Yeah, he's good. Have you read Sapiens, by the way? Uh, I'm, no. I'm going to give you that as a gift. It's yeah. a great book. So All anyway, right. a d- different parable. But yeah. Um, okay. Why don't we talk about some of the cash injected into, into yeah. Virginia? I would love to. So let's pull up, uh, Judah, if you will, the, um, the PPP uh, grant. I got obsessed with the Federal Pay uh-huh. uh, website last week because you can look up any business's PPP uh-huh. funding. Cool. And as a business owner and somebody who likes to do competitor research, you can get a, I mean, you pretty much know what their personnel costs are. And uh-huh. if you know the industry, uh-huh. then you know what their overhead costs are. So then you know what their revenue should be at minimum. Uh-huh. And you know if they took a second PPP funding that they took a loss. So if they didn't take a second PPP funding, they turned a profit there. Uh-huh. So I could look at all my competitors and say, so you actually turned a profit during the pandemic and you didn't. Um, and so I found it to be very helpful. So I got obsessed with it for about two hours. So anyway, that's where all this data is from. And I will make sure to get, I think all of it is, is linked in here, but if, if I post on social media, you can get to it. So this is basically Virginia's PPP funding distribution, the top five uh, types of businesses that got funding. So in total, Virginia got uh, $17.7 billion, um, which I think is about 2.2% of the national um, one of those, one of those categories, one of those industries does not fit with the other ones. Taxi service? No. Oh, dentists? No. The real estate agents, the full service restaurants, undoubtedly impacted by COVID. Dentists, hugely impacted by COVID. Beauty salons and taxi services, hugely impacted by COVID. 2020 for real estate was the best year in the history of real estate. Yeah, Keith, you want to get, so this, you know know what this tells me is that the PPP funding did did not do exactly what it was supposed to do. If there's industries that got extra funding, you know, if the real estates are, the real estate agents and these these organizations are are getting extra funding, guarantee you they're going to be investing more money in real estate, right? Um, so anyway, this is just a, a distribution of it and where that funding came out. So just showing that about you know, $17.7 billion came into um, Virginia businesses. Judah, do me a favor. Now go to the stimulus uh, bill. So I had to workshop these numbers a little bit, but we've essentially had three rounds of stimulus. We had the CARES. We had... Cool. That's coming out. Yeah, There's about okay. a five-second delay here. Yeah, cool. We had the, the CARES funding. We had the, I can't remember what the second, uh, the Consolidated Appropriations Act and the American Rescue Plan. And so I had to run some numbers on adults and, and the, the number of children and how many percentage of people got that in Virginia. But the first round saw about a $6.7 billion injection into Virginia. Second round saw about $4.2 billion. And the third round is going to see about $10 billion. So between that, I think the, the point is between that and the PPP funding, this is, I think, part of the skilled labor uh, crisis is there's a lot of confidence. People have lots of money right now as a whole, and there's a lot of money injected into it. And so, you know, when we look at this, in hindsight, I don't know if we could have done anything different. Jerry, if you, when you look at these numbers, would you, 
these numbers pretty high. You're fiscally conservative. You know, is this injecting too much money into the economy? What would you have done with the money? I, I, I think this is. Um, it's about forty billion. I in, think this in is, from my standpoint, absurd. Mm -hmm. We're devaluing the dollar. We're putting so much free money into the American ecosystem that we're incentivizing folks not to work. We're causing inflation. But we have a short-term fix for that, right? We could cut off unemployment. We could do a lot of things. So, And that's happening by yeah. requiring the job yeah. applications now at the end of the month. But what we've done over the last 15 months, A, we've devalued the dollar. Having large cash positions now, yes, it could breed some security and some, some feeling of confidence. But having a large cash position right now is just not smart. Your money is not accruing any kind of additional interest in a bank account, especially with interest rates where they are. The second thing is we've incentivized Americans, at least the large portion of Americans, to stay on their couch and, and not do anything. The third thing is once this faucet has been shut off, which it's getting shut off, mm -hmm. what the hell is going to happen? Recession. <laughs> there's, the bull, there's the bear right there. So you're saying this is a house of cards that's about to crumble. Yep. That's what you're saying. Yep. And then once this faucet is shut off, and you can go back to the, uh, go back to yep. us on screen, please. Once this house of cards, once this faucet is done, you say the house of cards crumbles. I think so. Yeah, we've, th th I think this is part of the reason why economists are, are having a tough time figuring out what's happening is it's is just been so much money in injected and we've, oh, we've made people overconfident. I think the, the economy was a little overconfident given the fact that we know we were in, in a pandemic. And, and I don't know, maybe overconfidence is too strong. You know, we, maybe we were sufficiently confident that we didn't, that we didn't have mass hysteria break out. Um, this is an interesting comment. This is from Neil Williamson. I'm curious if property management firms are lumped into real estate firms. They clearly had a big COVID impact. Do you know that? In that mm -hmm. real estate category, if it was property management lumped into that category as well? Uh, I'll be honest. It, when you look at the data, the people were self-reporting their categories, so there was a lot of people in the wrong category. But I would assume that when you're talking about you know, 300,000 businesses, the aggregate probably holds. So I, I don't know the answer to that. Federalpay.org, you can find out. Bill says, I am retired and I'm more than happy to receive money back from the government. <laughs> Props to you, Bill. He's retired. He's getting free money. Definitely. Yeah? Yeah. So your... Don't forget, we got to save time mental for... Health. Mental health. I yeah. Know, I know. You get, me, you get me talking. Marquis says, Ryan Holmes is booming in Lake Monticello, right across from BP and Ace Hardware. Jay, man, you got a lot of comments. James Watson, just because Seville Real Estate did well, it doesn't mean all realtors statewide did well or mm -hmm. felt comfortable getting out there, particularly in, the, particularly in the beginning of the pandemic. Good comment, James. Very I just gave comment. you a, a, a like. Um, five Pharaoh's daughter came down to bathe at the river. Her maidens walked along by the riverside. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her handmaid to get it. She opened it and saw the child, and behold, the baby cried. She had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. That is not what I was talking about, but that's great <laughs> that you recited it. Yeah. This is the amazing thing of social media when used for the good. Um, this is interesting. This is from uh, Laura Navaris. Lee Elberson makes a compelling argument of why her, a recession is on the near horizon. <sighs> so there's, I'm not the only bear in the room. Thank you for that. Yeah, she just said that. She, you make a compelling argument. Oh, goodness gracious. Um, Keith Smith says he's going to try to set up a roundtable with Lisa Sturdivant, the, uh, the doctor, the Virginia economic doctor, or the Virginia realtor econo uh, economist. Yeah. Um, we got to save room for mental health. Yes. Can we also talk really quickly about sure. education? Jerry, you've done a good job plugging my future oh, education yeah. podcast. Yeah. Uh, had a really great discussions in the last couple of weeks. And plugging Claiborne. And, and plugging Claiborne, yes. Uh, we had Frank Friedman yesterday, and he told me something that I wasn't aware of. PVCC offering free tuition in the fall. Go, that's right, if, front and center on their website, pvcc.edu, front and center on their website. A full year if you, if you make the sufficient grades. I think you've got to get a GPA of 2.5. 2.5 or above. Yeah. Frank said that the goal is, is to put anybody over the edge who says, oh, you know, I can't really afford it right now. You can afford it. It's free. 
Go get that education. Anybody who even, if you're even thinking about it right now, you should do it. How do you feel, how do you feel about free education? How do you feel about free money? How this is a feel? whole other show, man. This is, a, it's, it's, it's another thing with wealth inequality, right? I mean, I think if... Does the free education devalue the education? Does the free education devalue the commitment to said education? If no, you had to pay for your school, are you willing to grind and work harder to learn the material because you're pulling the money out of your pocket that you earned and worked for as opposed to it being given to you? Do you know the worst, one of the things I hate the most, and hate is a wrong word. I'm trying to take hate out of my vocabulary. Good. Okay. One of the things that I do not like, my kid is three. On Saturday, we went to soccer. It was the last one of a six-week program. At the end of the six-week program, all the kids got pulled in. Every single one got a trophy. <laughs> I despise that. Jerry, you know why we don't like that? You and I are both co very competitive people. Yeah. And, and we want everyone to be like that. And I think... But that's not life. Yeah. There's winners and losers in it, life. There are. And I think acknowledging the effort that everyone did is one thing, but rewarding those who tried hard hardest, I think, should still be upheld. So, yeah. We're both very competitive we people. Want, we should reward those that tried hardest at the, seek, at the equal level of those who won the competition? We should acknowledge everyone's efforts, but we should reward those who finished top. Every kid getting a trophy mentality, I feel like that's just going to do a disservice to, to the generation as they get to work, as they get to the real life. I mean, I'm going to cut to the chase. The real world is freaking hard. It ain't easy. So and telling everyone that it's okay and things are going to be okay, here's your shiny thing. When you were sitting over there picking Danny Lions and, and pointing to your brain through your nose instead of kicking the soccer ball in the goal, that's not going to incentivize or help my little man. You know, but, Jerry, we grew up in a different time. We, we weren't, our, our brains weren't developing in an age where we were constantly comparing ourselves to somebody else on social media who has a better life, who has a bigger house, who has a faster car, who has more of this. That's You're true. looking at glimpses, minutes of people's week and saying, look at how good their life is. So I think students especially are constantly feeling like they are not good enough. So maybe this is a way, maybe that's part of this, this endeavor is to, to counteract that. And but maybe why? You, you know, why do we need to do that? Because otherwise, it, it, every, the, every student is going to feel like they're not good enough. Even the best. Okay, you got first place. Guess what? Somebody in California got first faster than you. That's good. Yeah. Why is that not good? Why, I, you know what I love to do? Not everybody Dude, reacts the same way we do. I, this is crazy. I'm going to throw this to you. Okay, I, we, we got to get to mental health. I know, gonna, I know, I know. Time, I'm sorry. What, time, How, is what, time, what time's a hard stop for you? What's your hard I, stop? I have to leave at about 2.15. Okay, 2.15 yeah. is your hard stop. Yeah. Okay. I would rather, and let's take the sports microcosm, okay, sports as an example, okay, I would rather get my ass kicked playing sports than beat someone's ass playing sports. I hate losing more than I like winning. Yeah. I despise losing more than I enjoy winning. Winning for me at whatever it is, eh, sure it's nice, but there's nothing more motivating for me than losing or getting my ass kicked and what it does for me from a mentality standpoint on how I then put the effort in on whatever goal I want to accomplish because I didn't reach it in the real time. It's not that dissimilar than the Marine Corps mentality, Jerry, but empathy, my friend, empathy. Sure. Not everybody is like you and I. Not everyone reacts to competition in, in the same way. And so if we are a small subset of people who react to competition like that. To put it in perspective, we were playing squash. And he plays squash a lot more than I do. And he and I are friends. Yeah. And we played squash one random morning. Mm -hmm. And he was in there. And he was beating me. And he was beating me pretty good. And Lee was in the box saying, this guy is a friend. This is what he was thinking. He wasn't saying this. Is this guy is a psychopath. <laughs> he's, he's diving and running into the floors. He's losing his temper. He's not happy. That he, do you remember? Yeah, oh yeah, big time. Yeah. And you're like, Jerry, this is a friendly squash game. 
Well, uh, but also I was winning. You if were? I been, if I'd have been losing, I would have been the same way. You would have been? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. definitely. I'm, yeah. I'm just as competitive okay. as you. But I think, again, it's, it's, it's acknowledging that not everybody responds to competition the same way. And, you know, the reality is... is would you say how we respond to competition is the right... Is, okay, there's no right or wrong way. But would you say how we respond to competition and challenges is one of the reasons we've enjoyed success? It's it's a it's I'm not I don't think you can because you know where I'm going to go next. You, you, you can okay I'm gonna I'm gonna correct your statement. Okay. We have uh, our view of competition has shaped the way that we view success and we have achieved success in the way that we view it because of our competitive spirit. Okay, I agree with that. So like so that's it's it's a framing issue. So not everybody views should we shouldn't all view success the same way. You don't have to start a business and 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 be on television every day. You can view success as I'm just going to volunteer 1 hour a week and take care of my kids and that's that is I have a very successful and fulfilling life. So I here's what here's what I'll throw back at you. Even in a system where even if somebody says, hey, it's me, you, me, and Judah are, are going to have a race, but it's, it, we're not going to give any trophies, I'm still actually going to try to beat I'm going to go balls to the wall. <laughs> so, yeah. Which, with or without trophies. So, so maybe that's the argument of like, we don't need tr- trophies because we're going to be competitive anyway. So the system is helping to buffer. We're creating wussies of the next generation. You can be crappy Spoken at this. Spoken by the least empathetic man in you, the studio. I, you, I have empathy. I have empathy. I am the least empathetic man in the studio. That is, I will, I will wear this Judas Nodding set over there. I will, I will, I will take that on. But what are we going to... You come in last place and you get the same award as the first place guy? What is that going to do for the last place guy? Good pivot here to... Mental, mental health. health month. Mental yes. health. May. Bill says next election, Jerry Miller. That's right. And that's why I'm running. And I do expect to win. I expect to win it. I expect you to win too. You announced early. You've got a, a big fan base. You've uh, announced what you're going to corner. Try to corner the market. Run the campaign like a business. That's literally what I'm trying to do. Mental health. I'm sorry, Lee. So I enjoy this with you. I know this is great. This is yeah. The show. I always think that we're going to stop got, at a certain time. Twenty one minutes. Keep on going. I know. All right. So I, I think. It's important to understand like the objective of mental health. First, okay. I think let's, we should acknowledge the crisis that's out there. So Gallup surveyed adults, and two years ago, about 11% of adults said that they experienced some form of anxiety or depression. In the last year, do you know what that percentage jumped to? What? Guess. Give, give, the, give the statement again. What, so two years ago, 11% of adults said that they had some symptoms of anxiety or depression. And what now, is that percentage now? I'd say it's 4 x Man, you're right on. Okay, it's 44, it's, it's, 50%. It's, four, it's about 43%. Yeah. So That's a reflection of COVID, though. Yeah, that's, it's, it's, a, it's certainly a reflection of COVID, but guess what? That, it's not going to just drop. Like anxiety and depression are things that once it takes a lot longer to get rid of them than it does to, to, to build up anxiety and depression. And so the point of Mental Health Month is to just raise awareness for that. So that fact alone should let you know you're probably not the only person in your workspace exhibiting this. And the best thing you can do is, is to just slowly start to talk to others about the way you're feeling. And I think even more than that, I think about what I do for for my mental health and i do a lot of things as you know you're taking a 90 day trip for your mental health also spend time with your beautiful wife but that's for your mental health she loved me on the show by the way but um yeah so i think in thinking about how you do things and you have to if you have to a position where you have to run 110 miles an hour and it's just like oh, i'm just got to cram a little bit in you're in the car you shouldn't be on your phone you're trying to text you're trying to do something so an easy exercise that I think everybody can do is a very simple breathing exercise. Oh. So everybody says, go, go for a walk. You're talking HUSA. Talking HUSA. Yeah. I know this sounds like hippie new age stuff. Coming from a physicist. I know. I, mean, I was going to say that. Coming from, <laughs> and I used to think the same thing. People would talk about like, oh, drink chamomile tea and do all this and breathing exercise. Drink some more milk. And do yoga. Yeah, do all this stuff. It, it sounds like hippie new age crap. You know, it did to me. Once I started doing it, my stress went down dramatically. Okay, I don't, so tell me, so do you have stress? 
You feel stress? Yes. I would be lying if I said I don't feel stress. Anxiety? Uh, I, 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 do, I do feel anxiety. You worry? They're very temporary. Yes, I do worry. You worry, feel stress, and have anxiety? Yes. But they're all, they're very temporary. And I know exactly, like, I, you can usually have good predictors of when the onset is, and I know how to get rid of them. And I don't usually wake up stressed and, and anxious. It usually takes something to trigger an event during a week. I just work in a, in a position where I'm very high likelihood with all the organizations I manage to have those triggers. So great exercise that everyone can do is, I know you're smiling. <laughs> Everybody says go for a walk. Okay, the problem is when you go for a walk, you're thinking about work stuff, you're thinking about what you're going to get your wife for her anniversary. Um, the best thing you can do is try to take a full inhale and exhale every 10 steps. Focus on five steps inhale and five steps out. And you'll notice that like even the sheer fact that you're focusing on trying to count those things removes the ability of your brain trying to focus on like, oh, should I refinance? My dad said he's going to do this. Or, my gosh, I miss my brother's birthday. It'll push all those thoughts out and just get you back to a, like a normal breath. And that can remove stress, like 70% of your stress just with that breathing exercise. Yoga, have you ever done yoga, my friend? Yeah. Yeah. I have done it. How yoga. often do you do it? I've done it maybe three times in my entire life. What if I told you that if you went once a week, it would make everything in your life happier? You want to try an experiment with me? You want to go with me? I feel pretty happy. <laughs> it's not, there's no limit to that, right? Would you, would, you, would you be willing to try it with me and then you Sure. Could you know I'd be willing to try anything. So that's, that's what it takes. If you have a practice that, that helps you de-stress, try to get somebody else involved. And I think another, another thing that, that students, you know, that parents can do for their kids is you can't ask your kids to practice mental health that you're not doing. Kids are going to watch, you're, they're going to watch you and they're going to take after what you're doing. So if you're always going 100 miles an hour and you're always stressed out and you're using social media as like a, an escape to try to get away from that stress, your kids are going to do the same thing. If you are taking, breathe, if you're, you're going out for walks and, and doing breathing exercises and, and finding activities that replenish you, your kids are going to do the same thing. I not I hate, I know I'm always harsh on social media and that's because I'm I'm not on it but like my only my only friend I know that's not on Facebook is sitting across from me right now. Yeah. Finding activities that like really get you to focus on one thing at a time. That's another thing that psychologists say we struggle with is we're always trying to task switch. How many times are you like trying to do a thousand things? I do that all the I'm time. I'm doing it right now. I'm thinking doing about the contract that I'm writing right after the show. Yeah, you're doing that and you're on your phone yeah. you're trying to manage this. So, but I thrive on that. Yes, but you're likely to have a shorter lifespan if you consistently do that in your life. If you're always doing that, you're likely to have shorter breaths and your stress level is going to be higher. Some people say, oh, I, I thrive in a stressful environment. You, you don't. The statistics are plain and clear. You're going to live longer and you're going to have a higher quality of life if you reduce your stress. And that's what Mental Health Month is all about. You don't always have to like go camping and bug out for a weekend like my wife and Alex and I did last weekend. You don't have to play with Legos. That's been my recent thing. It sounds weird for an adult to be playing with Legos. <laughs> but I put my phone away. There's no music. And I just listen to like clicks. And the idea is that I can start a task and finish it. And that has actually translated to my work life. I accomplish tasks a lot more frequently now that I've started playing with Legos. Isn't that a weird correlation? No, no. You found, uh, you found uh, something to shift your attention from the items that cause stress in your life. I think the other thing that, that kids can do is surround yourself with people that you admire. You probably, you do this a lot. This is, you invite people in the show that you admire. I surround myself with people that I admire and you'll start to pick up on some of their healthy habits. I have a lot of friends that work in the mental health field and a lot of them I think, God, you take a mental health day, you do this? And then I think, you take a whole day to do this? Hmm, I only take an hour. And so, I think that's a big part of mental health. Mark. Marquis says Batman or Harry Potter Legos. I'm a Technic Harry Potter guy. I actually just finished building a, a Land Rover this big. I'll send it to Jerry and he'll post it. Oh, you'll media. send us a photo? I'll I, post that on the I Love Seville Network. I tell you, actually, I'll send you a YouTube. I did a speed build, which kind of actually gets away from what I was talking about. I'm enjoying yeah, it. That's the opposite of That's you. the opposite. So, but the, that's a TV show now. What? The Lego speed build. Yeah. Did you know that? I did. Yeah. 
I'm well, a there's big, teams competing. Oh, I, I, I've got a, I'm subscribed to a lot of different Lego channels. But yeah, I like the way the gears <laughs> fit together. So it doesn't have to be Legos, but like, I think as an adult, find something you did as a kid that sparked joy in you. Well, that's good. Uh, my, uh, my, uh, he's using Star Wars, Marquis. Oh, my gosh. Does he have the Millennium Falcon? Because that is like the quintessential <laughs> set. I love that. <laughs> I just love it. <laughs> Best use of $500 is to buy that. $500? Mm-hmm. How much have you spent on Legos? Uh, yeah, my friend asked me. I've probably How spent... much have you spent on that Jeep? Uh, yeah, I have, don't have that much in that Jeep. The rooftop tent was the most expensive What's thing. that Jeep? Can I ask? Is this an inappropriate question to ask? I know asking how much is not a good question. No, no, no. That Jeep new is about $30,000. Okay, so, and tricked out? Uh, tricked out is probably about three or $4,000 into it. Okay, But okay. we can go, we can take free vacations every weekend with the exception of food. So that's how I justify that cost. But there you go. Legos I've probably spent about $500 on. I got my eyeballs on the Bugatti Chiron. That one's about 400 bucks. So I'm <laughs> saving up for that. For, you know, I, I'm going to cut to the chase. Okay, I don't... Um, choose my words carefully. I rarely choose my words carefully. Um, I don't feel stress or anxiety. And I don't worry. And I'm not marginalizing stress, anxiety, and worry. Because I know many folks do. From my standpoint, stress, anxiety, and worry are emotions that cloud or convolute where you're trying to go. They're byproducts of uncertainty, byproducts of fear, and byproducts of lack of confidence. My standpoint, one of my outlets is, as you know, racket sports. I try to do it every day. And spending time with good people and spending time with my wife and my kid, two favorite people. And if I can get those things consistent and harmonious in my life, then things click and they work. I'm very happy to hear that. Uh, I'm going to play devil's advocate for the the sake of a talk show. Okay. I like that line. All human beings (laughs) exhibit worry, anxiety, and stress. Okay. Okay. Are you a human being? Yeah. Okay. I'm not a robot. So, I'm not a Lego <laughs> robot. <laughs> that would be really cool. Um, so I would say that you found a way to minimize those. I don't think that there's a way. You can, I don't think anyone in the world is able to eliminate them. I think I've certainly been in cases where I can ignore them. I don't think you're doing that. I hope you're not doing that because then it, it, it'll be much worse. But we all exhibit those to some form in our goal should be to minimize those and acknowledge them when they happen and think about what prompted them. What are your, um, what did you call them, your cues? Yeah, prom- yeah or things prompt, that, that, yeah. that are prompt, uh, personnel issues at my companies. If there's ever any sort of conflict or I have an employee that is struggling with something, that immediately raises my anxiety because I'm a, I feel like I'm a very empathetic person and I am, am worried about their outcome. I don't usually worry about, I probably don't worry about company finances as, as much as I should, or maybe we're just in a, Good not spot. in a terrible position. Yeah. But yeah, I think that's what, what prompts me the most, is, is worrying about that. Marquis says, me either, Jerry. Your, your show helps me control my emotions. Coming together with people from all walks of life with a show like this, thank goodness for Charlottesville. Thank you for saying that. That's what we're trying to do here. That's great. Um, Got a voter there. I hope so. Um, thank you, Marquise. You are A plus, dude. Seriously. I, you know I mean that. I really appreciate that. Yeah. Love you. Yeah. Hey, Scott Williams taught us this. I know. I love you. Yeah. It's like, he, this is what Scott Williams taught Lee and I. Scott Williams of Camp for Real. Camp for Real. Um, CIC graduate. CIC grad, superstar. Yeah. He says, Scott Williams said, men should say I love you to each other more and not in the way where it's a marginalized I love you. I love not you, a, man. Yeah. yeah. I love you, man. By adding the man at the end of I love you, you're being macho and marginalizing the I love you. You should just say I love you. Parents with kids, you should send them to one of Scott's uh, camps in the summer. He does a great job of talking about mental health and physical 
and, and, how, and dietary. I think he covers the, the, the big ones. So Scott's a great guy and runs some awesome camps. Uh, Bill says, does Claiborne do biblical tutoring? Because Jerry may need it. <laughs> The Claiborne does not do biblical tutoring. We probably could. You know, my uh, business partner, the founder, Clay, uh, started his own church and oh, okay. is, uh, yeah, know that. went to seminary and could probably school us all in every biblical verse ever. Keith Smith, the lens of success changes as one gets a little older. My view of success is very different. I'm almost 60 than it was when I was almost 30. And then he says, let's put this into the current real estate environment of competitive bids. There are winners and losers with every deal we do every day. Stephanie um, offers some perspective in regards to the, uh, the trophy mentality. Stephanie, we enjoy when you watch the show. And she says she agrees with my take on, uh, on trophies and what it's doing to kids. Um, hard work gets the trophy. If you want it, work for it. Um, what'd you make? Key is a Marine. And we have five minutes. I'm, we'll get you out on 215 on the dot. Why don't we get a photo of Lee? I mean, he's looking dapper right here. <laughs> Let's get a photo for the preview of the show. We gotta make sure, so a lot of times we've been taking action photos during the show, and the folks are like deep in conversation. Yeah. So sometimes their look is like, yeah, we gotta get one where you're smiling. Pull, you Not know what, a, a, tr a broadcasting trick? When you're sitting down, you pull the coattails of your jacket and you sit on them. Oh. And you can sit on the coattail. You know how when you're sitting, it kind yeah. of, uh, yeah. So you sit on your coattails, there we go. Yeah, Lee Alverson's, look, we're doing a photo. Make sure you're smiling, okay? We can send this to Alex too. This could be a Christmas card photo. You've got to have her in it. Yeah, so you need your Christmas card. Yes. All right, this is not going to be the Christmas card photo. And we need Albert the cat. Albert the cat in the photo. Yeah, he's got his on Instagram, too. Albert the cat does? Prince Albert Einstein. Yeah, so let me understand something. Let me understand something. Lee Albertson is not on Facebook, but Albert the cat has an Instagram, I, and the Jeep you drive has an Instagram. Yeah. My, my wife does a great job of, of managing those pages, yeah. She does? Very yeah. nice. Uh, all right, we have three minutes. Get us out of here on anything, anything you want to go. Listen to his podcast. It's on Wednesdays. Claiborne Education Facebook page, The Future of Education. Yeah. It's absolutely phenomenal. He really takes a deep dive into education and where it's heading. Um, three minutes. We'll get you out of here on time. Anywhere you want to go. Yeah, so I think... Um, I'm hoping everyone is looking forward to a more normal summer. I think that for those of us who are vaccinated, and even if you're not, try to start to plan some of those activities. Have barbecues. Jerry is invited to mine in a few weeks. Um, you know, Thank plan you. trips, plan outdoor trips, and I think that's really going to raise our, our mental health. And all these big issues that we talk about, upcoming re recession, what do I know? I'm just a dude who looks at a spreadsheet. You know, there's people much smarter than me uh, projecting how we should do. So just try to live in the moment and, and really enjoy it. And that's what I'm doing. I'm getting ready to go to a bachelor party in three weeks. Get out. Where? Yeah. Uh, we're going to Louisville. Oh, cool. Doing some bourbon tasting. Nice. Yeah. My friend Brandon Canty is, is getting married. And on I, a plane? I'm getting on a plane. Uh, no, I'm driving. Okay. Uh, is that out of choice? Yeah, it's, it's out of choice. I'm going to be flying the, the month after that. I'm flying to California in July. Okay. Yeah. Is that a uh, stress, flying to Cali? Probably a, a little bit, but I'll do a... A, a husa, a, a some good, yoga, do, and take some, five deep breaths. Hmm. Yeah, I'll do that before. We're going to do a Hot Ones Challenge. I've been telling you, we should do a Hot Ones Challenge on the show. You know what that is? No. YouTube series, Hot Ones. You should check it out. Okay. They have sauces of increasing heat up to the hottest hot sauce in the world, which makes you cry a little bit, and you just tap out at any time. That'd be cool. Well, you're from Louisiana. Uh, so you have, a, you have an affinity for hot things. I do, I do. A part of the show that's interesting is you ask people increasingly difficult questions as they get, and when your brain starts processing the, the heat, you start slipping up on your filters a little bit, so you sort of let go at some answers. So if we did this on the show, I could ask you some really in-depth questions really press you about like hey are you really don't feel any stress yeah well yeah. It's, that's that's not stress for a moment i'm just kidding. okay all right all right here last question we'll get you out of here we have 90 seconds cool. what is the hottest thing you've eaten in charlottesville virginia or in this area the hottest food and it can't be something that you make it's something that other people mm -hmm. could find and eat themselves uh what's the thai place next to five guys in barracks is it thai 99 uh terra thai terra thai yeah <sighs> lit me up one day. I asked him for Thai hot and up, lit me up. I, my ears were ringing when I was eating it. Yeah. 
But you know what? What? I kept eating it. Yeah, of course you did. And it, I'm and addicted it clears to it. you out afterwards. Yeah, you yeah. feel great colors start to pop more. <laughs> <laughs> Outside of that, I don't know of anything else that's, that's super spicy. Oh, man. Multiple, we're we're going to get them out of here on this. Multiple people are saying phenomenal show. Um, it always is with this guy. Good friend of the program, CEO of Claiborne Education, just a stand-up dude, Lee Elderson. We have 25 seconds. Unfortunately, you got the best parking space out of here, so we can get them out of here at the 215 hard stop. That's perfect. Look at that. I'm going to make it just in time for my session with my student. He's going to be happy. This is the I Love Seville show. Tomorrow, Jabari Wallington to talk supply chain constraints and how it could impact menu pricing at mom and pop restaurants. And then we will compare those enhanced menu prices to the economies of scale that big chains and big box restaurants have. We're going to compare and contrast the future of a mom and pop versus a chain restaurant tomorrow on the I Love Seville show. One Thank more thing. Don't sure. forget, a week from tomorrow, uh, Quentin Beckham and I are doing Two Truths and a Lie on your show, oh, I yeah. think. When is that? Is that two, is It's that, a week from tomorrow. Okay. On yeah. Real Talk. Real Talk, yeah. It's on Real Talk, yeah, because yeah. Keith is uh, out of town. Yep. So you, me, and Quentin, we're going to go here on this desk. Mm-hmm. Okay. Got the buzzers. Okay, fantastic. It's the I Love Seville show, guys. I hope you enjoyed it today. We'll see you tomorrow. Take care. Good show, dude. That was fun.